whatever that means. <laughs> C-A-C-H-E, it's a word. Come on, Cache. There we go. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Today's guest wrote a book called The Plan A Diet. Her name is Sid Nutter, and I never forgot her because she did a great presentation on the show before, and today she's going to be talking about inflammation in your diet, or and your diet, but it's probably because it's in your diet, and she's going to be making a delicious recipe, a roasted balsamic mushroom quinoa salad. Please welcome back to the show, Sid Nutter. See, I never forgot her. <laughs> Thank you, Chef AJ. It's a pleasure to be back. You're welcome. You're not by any chance a fan of I Love Lucy, are you? Well, I used to be. I haven't seen it for many years. Right. I used to watch it incessantly when I lived in L.A. I can't even figure out how to turn the TV on here. But there was an episode where Ethel went back to her hometown and her name was Ethel May Potter. And they kept saying, Ethel May Potter. We never forgot her. And that's how I thought about that with your name. But I did never forget you ever since I met you. I think it was like 2010 at, at a conference in Ohio. Yeah, many years ago. I remember that. You and Chef Dell did a chef cook-off. And guess who won? Me. I won. <laughs> oh, well, that's great. So I'll get so 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 why is inflammation in our diet uh, relevant? It's very relevant because that inflammation is really a major factor in the majority of our chronic diseases. So this is a class I teach at our local college. I offer it quarterly, and it's the most popular class I offer there. Everybody wants to know about it because I think everybody's affected by it to some degree. So shall I just dive right yes. in? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you know what? Before you start, let me just acknowledge Rebecca Howe. Thank her for the super chat donation. It came so early. And uh, yes, please. Okay. Let me press on here then. So let's talk about what inflammation is. Well, Inflammation is the body's natural response whenever it detects the threat of harm. So it's like the body's guard dog in a way, or the body's natural defense system. And throughout most of human history, inflammation was thought to be a good thing. So there are two types of inflammation, acute and chronic. And acute inflammation is the body's response to an injury like a splinter or a cut or a burn and chronic. Oops. I heard something there. I wasn't sure what that was, but anyway, so um, the body rushes immune cells to that area whenever there's a splinter or a cut or a burn or, or any type of thing that needs healing. So that can often result in pain and redness and swelling and heat. In fact, the word inflammation comes from the Latin word inflammare, which means to set on fire. So the acute inflammation is designed to protect us and it lasts only a very short time as the healing process begins. So it's a very localized specific response to an infection or an injury and it's aimed at resolving a problem. And it's so cool, our bodies are so amazing. They're always striving to heal and they can do so through the immune system is just one way they do that. Chronic inflammation on the other hand or metabolic inflammation is the body's way of protecting us against some type of threat that's lurking in the body that should not be there. So the immune system goes on high alert because it's encountering a threat. So it sends immune cells throughout the body to begin the healing process or to try to combat that threat. So those activated immune cells are what result in a persistent, systematic, and, cr and chronic low grade levels of inflammation that play a part in the majority of our diseases today. So when inflammation overstays its welcome, then it's no longer protective to the system. It's actually damaging. It's as though we're red hot and painful all over on the inside because our immune system stays overactive trying to counteract these threats. So inflammation usually always starts with the immune system and it really is a double-edged sword because it's designed to protect us, but when it overstays its welcome, it becomes damaging. So several things can contribute to it, including tissue injury and damage, infections, irritants, toxins, pollutants, 
being overweight contributes to inflammation because our own fat tissues secrete inflammatory cells called cytokine cells, which you'll hear me mention more about later. But these cytokine cells are very damaging and they're involved in many aspects of inflammation, including fever and pain. And then being sedentary increases our pro-inflammatory markers as well, while physical activity decreases them. Smoking contributes to inflammation because nicotine activates these white blood cells called neutrophils, which in turn release inflammatory molecules. And then having high LDL cholesterol is another factor as well as bacteria, viruses, parasites, chronic stress, and poor sleep habits. And all of these factors contribute to inflammation because the body is sensing some type of threat. And it's interesting, just over the weekend, I read a really good article about COVID-19 and how inflammation plays a big part in that, right? Because our body is detecting that as a major threat, of course. But the greatest factor in the primary driver of inflammatory chronic disease is what we put directly into our bodies each day, three times a day, actually, and that is our food choices. So our food choices matter way more than any other factor, including environmental toxins and even our genetics. I had three slides at one time listing all the conditions linked to inflammation, but I condensed it down to one slide just to keep it uh, quicker. So acid reflux, allergies, Alzheimer's and dementia, arthritis, asthma, bronchitis, autoimmune diseases where the body begins to attack itself because it can no longer distinguish between a foreign substance and its own healthy cells and tissues. There's cancer, Crohn's disease, IBS, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, obesity, osteoporosis, and anything ending in itis like arthritis, bronchitis, tendonitis, plantar fasciitis. Anything ending in itis means that there's inflammation is heavily and severely involved. So we could spend hours talking about inflammation's role in all of these, but I think arthritis is the thing people most easily associate with inflammation. So let's take a look at how um, the two type, main types of arthritis are osteoarthritis, which is the breakdown of cartilage in the joints. And it doesn't usually occur as the result of an altered immune system though. This is associated with wear and tear or an injury of some type or a traumatic injury to the joint. The other type is inflammatory arthritis and there are many different forms including psoriatic arthritis and gout and rheumatoid arthritis which is the most common form. And that's when inflammation of the tendons and ligaments and joint linings, that all contributes to RA or rheumatoid arthritis which results in pain, stiffness, swollenness, limited movement, and fatigue. So again, we could spend hours talking about just arthritis and all those other diseases, but since inflammation, or since heart disease rather, is our number one killer, I do wanna take just a couple minutes to explain how inflammation harms our heart, right? Because everybody's been affected by heart disease to some degree, or they know someone who has for sure. So our arteries actually are one of the most likely sites for inflammation to occur because the lining of our arteries is where these deposited fats and cholesterol form plaques that resemble small sores. So naturally the body sees those small sores as a threat and it responds accordingly by sending immune cells out to heal the damage. So here's an illustration. So on the lining of our arteries is covered with a thin layer of protective cells called endothelial cells. And if you've ever followed Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn for any reason, you're probably familiar with endothelial cells and because he's always talking about the endothelial lining in our arteries. So in this illustration, that would be that thin pink layer on the inside of the healthy artery on the left. And these endothelial cells produce nitric oxide, which keeps our vessels open and keeps the blood flowing smooth. But when that lining gets damaged, um, fats and cholesterol can then enter the artery wall and pave the way for plaque formation as shown there in the artery on the right. 
And as mentioned before, those, the body sees those plaques as a threat. So it keeps those immune cells activated throughout the body and that results in chronic inflammation. But here's where it gets even trickier. Some of those hovering immune cells then switch teams. They go from being protective cells to damaging cells. And when those damaging immune cells combine with the fats and cholesterol that's already there, then they contribute to even more plaque formation and even more con continuous inflammation. So it's like a vicious cycle that starts to take place. Some of those damaging immune cells are called cytokines. I mentioned them earlier. And those cytokines are really nasty. They can recruit other cells too to, to um, release a whole bunch of damage and create symptoms which lead to eczema, fatigue, and arthritis. So I found a study that was released, released in March of 2018 by the Lajala Institute for Allergy and Immunology. And this study was supported by the American Heart Institute the American Diabetes Association and the National Institutes of Health. And this study examined the role of those damaging immune cells. And what the study showed was that a diet high in fat and cholesterol depletes artery promoting or artery protecting immune cells, turning them into promoters of inflammation, which worsens plaque buildup that occurs in cardiovascular disease. And that's just what we've been talking about how those damaging immune cells lead to inflammation. So they also said that inflammation is a key contributor to the hardening and narrowing of the arteries. And one of the lead researchers was quoted as saying this, I'll have to read it. They said that people often think that atherosclerosis is just about cholesterol, diet and exercise, but it's actually an immune disease. The blockage of arteries is very much due to the immune system reacting to the excess cholesterol and fats in the walls of the blood vessels. And with a Western diet, those protective cells change to damaging cells causing more inflammation. So that's how inflammation, just very much in a little thimble full there of information of how inflammation harms the heart. So let's get on to the foods now. I've got good news and bad news. So what do you wanna hear first? Oh, I guess the bad news. Oh, good. Good. <laughs> good. Because that's where we're going to start with which foods are inflammatory. And the first one is processed sugar, specifically those refined sugars that are found in soft drinks, fruit juice, sweet tea, pastries, desserts, cookies, candy, snack cakes, and cereals. So sugar stimulates the something the production of something called free fatty acids, which triggers insul insulin resistance and inflammation. Sugar also triggers the release of those inflammatory cytokine cells that we mentioned. In just 40 grams of sugar a day, which is like one can of pop, leads to a big increase in inflammatory markers, weight gain, and LDL cholesterol. The next one is common oils, which are highly inflammatory, and that includes olive oil, canola, safflower, cottonseed, sunflower, you name it, any type of oil. And I know this might be surprising to some of you, since oils are often touted as health foods by savvy marketers and even some health professionals. So oils gained a lot of popularity back in the 1990s due to their use in the Mediterranean diet. And I'm always reluctant to call oil a food because what oil really is, is just the pure extracted fat from a food. Did you get that? That's really what oils are. They're the extracted fat that has been pressed or, or extracted from fish or plants or vegetables or seeds. And all oils are 100% pure liquid fat. And they're found everywhere too in our food, especially in fried foods and most packaged products like mayonnaise and dips and dressings and bakery items and certain breads and certain peanut butters and crackers and frozen entrees. In fact, the majority of our processed food usually has some type of oil in it. And then restaurant foods are loaded with oil too. So you have to be very careful when you're eating out. So these extracted oils come in at 120 calories per tablespoon and 14 grams of fat. So not only are they huge weight busters, but oils are big health busters as well. 
because they damage the endothelial lining of our arteries that we just were talking about, which paves the way for plaque formation. Plus oils are highly inflammatory due to their omega-6 content. So when we consume oils, especially in the form of omega-6, that oil metabolizes to another form of omega-6 in our body, something called LA or linoleic acid. And that promotes harmful uh, prostaglandins and other fatty molecules that contribute to inflammation. So oils impair our circulation. They have clotting factors equal to animal fats. They promote insulin resistance and they lower our uh, good cholesterol while raising the bad. And we know from Dr. Esselstyn and others that oils have a direct toxic effect on those protective endothelial cells, which line our arteries. And as we mentioned already, once those, that artery lining gets damaged, it paves the way for plaque formation and further increases our level of inflammation. So here's another interesting study I found that was released in 2018. And this was conducted by a heart institute in Kansas City. And the researchers there uh, looked at the effect of vegetable oil as, it, uh, as a driver of heart disease. And here's what they said at the end of the study. In summary, numerous lines of evidence show that the omega-6 polyunsaturated fat, linoleic acid, promotes oxidative stress, oxidized LDL, chronic low-grade inflammation, and atherosclerosis, and is likely a major dietary culprit for causing coronary heart disease, especially when consumed as vegetable oils. So what really caught my eye in this study too, is that the researchers stated that the intake of omega-6 fatty acids can be even more damaging to our endothelial cells than saturated fat. So that's why we wanna get all the added oils totally out of our diet. And I just wanna say a quick word here too about coconut oil since it remains very popular these days. Coconut oil is one of the worst, not only is it 100% fat as all oils are, but 92% of it is saturated fat. So to put that in perspective, a tablespoon of lard has five grams of saturated fat and a tablespoon of coconut oil has 12. So coconut oil has more than double the saturated fat as in lard. And the reason why this is important, and this is one reason that you'll need to remember, saturated fat is rated as the most pro-inflammatory food component, right? So saturated fat is the most pro-inflammatory, and we'll talk about which is the most anti-inflammatory in a second. But saturated fat is, uh, is you know, it contributes to heart disease, type two diabetes, dementia, and so much more. So beware of the savvy marketers out there and even some of the health professionals that are promoting coconut oil because what they've done is taken a small kernel of truth about coconut oil and spun a big tail around it. And, and so we need to keep coconut oil out of the diet. You can put it on your skin or your hair, just don't ingest it. Next is trans fats, which are hydrogenated oils or partially hydrogenated oils. And that's found in fast food, frozen pizza, cookies, crackers, ready to use frostings, coffee creamers, frozen pies, and so much more. So when oils are heated and treated with hydrogen, they go from being a liquid oil to a solid shortening, which is even higher in saturated fat than it was as a liquid. And these trans fats are a double whammy because they increase our bad cholesterol while lowering the good. They promote inflammation, obesity, insulin resistance, and so many other health problems. Even our government, who is really quite lenient with food manufacturers, said there, says there is no safe amount of trans fat. So a, year, a couple years ago, many years ago, actually, the government cracked down on trans fats. And so food manufacturers started using palm oils and, other, and coconut oil, other types of oils to replace it. But as we just looked at, we don't wanna be consuming any type of oil at all, especially trans fats. So how do meats and processed meats contribute to inflammation? Well, the biggest reason, one of the biggest reasons is the saturated fat, which as we just talked about is the single most pro-inflammatory food component. 
because the body reacts so negatively to the damage it creates. Another reason is this acidic sugar molecule called NEU5CGC, which triggers inflammation because it's not a molecule found in humans. So the body detects it as foreign and starts sending immune cells out to combat it and that results in inflammation. So NEU5GC is also to, um, shown to increase the risk of tumor formation. And then we have cholesterol, which as mentioned earlier on the heart slides, um, excess cholesterol triggers an inflammatory response and it becomes a vicious cycle because inflammation speeds up the accumulation of cholesterol, which produces even more inflammation and on and on. And eventually the deposited cholesterol hardens into a plaque. And if that plaque ruptures, you know, it, it um, creates the blood clots that lead to heart attacks and strokes. So I'm sure all of the viewers here know this, but I'll just say it, they state the obvious, plant foods contain no cholesterol, right? Zero cholesterol in plant foods. Also animals are fed a diet that's high in omega-6. And remember, we just talked about omega-6 and excess, excess of omega-6 is very inflammatory. And studies confirm too, that the higher animal protein we eat, the higher levels of inflammatory markers there are inside of our blood. Then meats also contain something called AGEs, advanced glycation end products, which are known inflammation triggers. And these compounds are formed when protein or fat combined with sugar in our bloodstream. That's a process called glycation. So these AGEs can form in our body or they are present in food. So certain cooking methods of, of meat, such as uh, grilling and frying and sauteing and roasting, that can cause the level of AGEs to skyrocket in food. And then we move on to dairy products such as milk, butter, cheese, yogurt, ice cream, and sour cream, and all inflammatory for a couple of reasons. One again is the high saturated fat. It contains those advanced glycation end products we just talked about, and toxins too. And plus dairy is also a common allergen that can trigger inflammatory responses such as stomach distress, constipation, diarrhea, skin rashes, and hives. And many people don't even realize they're allergic to dairy until they stop consuming it and then realize how much better they feel. And by the way, do you know what the highest source of saturated fats in the Western diet, in our diet? It's cheese, right? So cheese is the very highest source of saturated fat and again, highly inflammatory. The next inflammatory food are refined grains. And we know that whole grains are very health promoting, but the refined grains such as white rice, white bread, white flour, certain noodles, cakes, cookies, biscuits, pastry, cereals, and pretzels are inflammatory because those whole grains have been stripped of their outer coatings where all the fiber and nutrition lives. And once those grains are stripped down, they're devoid of fiber, which spikes our blood sugar and causes that pro-inflammatory chemical reaction called glycation. So other things that contribute to inflammation are the regular consumption of alcohol, which can damage the intestinal lining and lead to a condition called leaky gut. And once that happens, that drives inflammation throughout the entire body. Alcohol also suppresses the immune system and it impairs the function of key organs. So the Arthritis Foundation on their website, they list several warnings about drinking if you're going to consume NSAID drugs. That's N-S-A-I-D, the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen or Aleve or acetaminophen. So if you're taking those things while and you're drinking, you might want to check out the Arthritis Foundation's website for uh, the warnings about doing that. Another uh, inflammatory thing are food components, additives and sweeteners, fake sweeteners, such as MSG and aspartame. Again, the body detects these man-made things as foreign threats, right? So it dispatches immune cells out to try to combat them. And those suffering from RA or rheumatoid arthritis are especially susceptible to inflammation triggered by additives. And then there's fill in the blank for any food allergies or sensitivities that someone might have. And 
The most common are gluten, dairy, nuts, eggs, and nightshade vegetables if you're sensitive to solanine. Okay, enough of the bad news. Let's move on to some good news now, which the anti-inflammatory foods, which are starchy foods like potatoes, beans, rice, legumes, and whole grains. And these foods are anti-inflammatory because they contain resistant starch, fiber, and anthocyanins. In fact, remember how we talked about saturated fat being the most pro-inflammatory food component? Well, fiber is the most anti-inflammatory food component. And beans are an especially great source because they've got folic acid, antioxidants, and they're also really high in fiber. And then vegetables, fruits, mushrooms, and dark greens because they're high in antioxidants, lycopene, flavonoids, carotenoids, fiber, folic acid, and other anti-inflammatory properties. So go for a big range of colors with your fruits and veggies and, and get lots of those different phytochemicals, which just means plant chemicals. And whole grains such as steel cut oats and brown rice, barley, quinoa, buckwheat, and wild rice. These foods are high in fiber, so they boost the immune system because they feed the beneficial gut bacteria, which reduces the risk of inflammation. So our good gut bacteria thrive on fiber, whereas the pathogenic bacteria in our gut thrive on meat and dairy. And then whole soy foods are also anti-inflammatory because of the isoflavins, the omega-3 and the phytoestrogens, which just means plant estrogens. So that would be things like tofu or soy milk or edamame or miso. And these products should always be purchased organic or at least non-GMO. And I know that I watched your recent interview with Dr. Christy Funk recently, and she was a big promoter of whole soy foods too. Even um, I know a lot of people are concerned about soy foods for cancer, but it's the whole soy foods that are actually protective from cancer. And then we have nuts and seeds like almonds and walnuts and Brazil nuts and chia seeds and ground flax seed. And all of these foods contain omega-3, magnesium and vitamin E, which are very anti-inflammatory properties. And then herbs and spices like garlic, turmeric, ginger, curry, and so on. And these um, foods contain powerful chemical compounds that are known to lower inflammation, support the immune system, and improve the digestive system. Green tea is another great anti-inflammatory drink because it's a rich source of polyphenols and catechins, especially one called epigalacocatechin 3 gallate or EG. CG for short. And this was another thing I heard Dr. Christy Funk talk about on her recent podcast and why it's good to, to drink green tea. It's very protective because of the, that EGCG is a very potent anti-inflammatory property. So always purchase high quality tea and mix and brew it correctly for the maximum results. So overall plant foods contain fiber, especially beans and legumes and whole grains. And all of these foods are wonderful sources of fiber and fiber releases butyrate into the bloodstream, which provides broad anti-inflammatory effects. So remember this, fiber is only found in plant foods, right? There's no fiber in milk or pork chops or chicken or salmon or eggs or yogurt, right? Fiber is only found in plant foods. In a high fiber diet, it's related to a much lower risk of arthritis, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So the RDA for fiber is about 32 grams a day, but less than 3% of Americans are getting that. They're getting about 15 to 17 grams a day, so like half the RDA. And the healthiest people on earth are getting 45 grams of fiber a day through their food. So we're not talking about Benafiber here or Fiber One because those are man-made functional fibers, which do provide some uh, benefit, but they don't provide nearly the, the benefit as when we consume our fiber through whole plant foods. So a whole food plant-based diet offers 50, 60, or even more grams of fiber every day. And fiber again is only found in plant foods and it's the most anti-inflammatory food component we can eat. So before I wrap this up, I just wanna share, this is, this statistic just blew me away. So I have to share this 
This is the Dietary Inflammatory Index. A little information about that. It was developed in 2019 by the American Institute for Cancer Research, the National Institutes of Health, and the Prevent Cancer Foundation. And the goal of this index was to evaluate the implications of chronic inflammation in our major diseases. So the index doesn't rate individual foods per se, but rather it rated 45 different parameters of food. And broadly speaking, so the components of processed food and animal products, such as the saturated fat, the trans fats and the cholesterol were all rated to be very pro-inflammatory whereas the fiber and phytonutrients found in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and certain spices were found to be strongly anti-inflammatory, basically confirming everything we just talked about. So on the index, the pro-inflammatory diets were given a high score and the anti-inflammatory diets were given a low score. So the higher inflammatory scores, you know, the more pro-inflammatory foods that were eaten not only did they say that equated to feeling lethargic and tired, but it resulted in a lower function of the kidneys, lungs, and liver, higher risks of cardiovascular disease, impaired memory and mental health, type two diabetes, osteoporosis, arthritis, weight gain, and many types of cancer, a 75% increased odds of cancer. So that's what blew me away right there. <laughs> Like we're not, even if it was 20 or 30%, right? That would be uh, worth our attention, but a 75% increased odds of developing cancer, the more inflammatory the diet is. And I, that just blew me away. So the researchers also said that when it came to those NSAID drugs, those non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, they might reduce the risk of some type of cancer, but they come with adverse side effects. And the researchers, concluded that dietary modification is safer and more beneficial than NSAIDs. So let's repeat that last line because that is major, major right there. Dietary modification is safer and more beneficial than NSAID drugs. So I just had to share that. That just blew me away when I saw that statistic. So what can you do if you suspect you have inflammation? Well, you, there's a blood test called the CRP which stands for C-reactive protein blood test. And it's a measurement of chronic inflammation going on somewhere in the body. So C-reactive protein is produced in the liver and levels of it rise when we have inflammation in the body. So CRP levels are ideally kept under one milligram per liter. And that's the safest for cardiovascular disease. But if we get some type of infection, it can jump to hundred milligrams per liter. But the medical community is now saying that having a baseline of just two or three increases the risk for cardiovascular disease. So having a reading under one indicates a low risk, between two and three indicates a moderate risk, and higher, higher than three indicates a high risk of heart attack or stroke. So uh, the levels, sadly, the levels of many middle-aged Americans today exceeds the number of one suggesting that most of us are indeed suffering from chronic inflammation. So if you do have a high CRP level or some type of inflammation, the best steps to take would be to determine the underlying cause and address it with lifestyle change. As we mentioned earlier, diet is by far the biggest factor when it comes to inflammation. There are other factors too, like smoking and being overweight, but diet is the number one. So um, when inflammatory foods are a part of the underlying root cause of the problem, then the optimal solution would be to change the foods that are being consumed. And again, the body is always striving to heal itself. We've got that going for us in our favor. You know, your body always wants to heal. And when we give it the right dietary environment to do that, that's when the healing can really take place. So other lifestyle things would be to quit smoking to exercise, get that uh, physical activity into your routine and reduce your stress levels. It's also important to address any weight loss issues that need to take place because dozens of studies show that obesity is strongly associated with increased CRP levels, right? That's because as we mentioned earlier, our own fatty uh, tissues 
are actively secreting those inflammatory cytokine cells. But again, the biggest and best thing you can do is to consume the most anti-inflammatory and health promoting diet available, which is a high fiber, densely nutritious, whole food plant-based diet with no added oils, which can reduce CRP levels by 30% in just two weeks. So imagine what it could do if you ate this way all the time, right? So I don't have time to go into all of this. Uh, this is usually a, like a 90 minute class when I offer it. So I've condensed it way down. But one of the things I talk about in the long class is the miracle claims that are out there. And a lot of things like cactus juice, which are you know, being sold to cure uh, inflammation and all that. And there's not time to go into all of that, but just remember that it's the totality of your diet that matters the most. Okay, so adding one or two superfoods is not going to offer much, if any, relief. Now, that's not to say there aren't some superfoods out there like berries and flaxseed and turmeric. You know, there's lots of really good foods out there. But just adding those to a poor diet is not really the answer. It's the totality of the diet that matters the very most. Okay, so that's all I'm going to share here because we want to make the roasted mushroom quinoa salad. But um, in the other class, which is available on my website, actually, uh, the longer class talks about antioxidants, how important that is. Um, it talks about um, the common misconceptions about plant-based eating. And then there's label reading included too. So how do you know if a, if a product you're looking at contains inflammatory foods, right? So there's label reading tips for that. And there's also tips on how to get started eating this way, should you decide that that's what you wanna do. Wow. Talking talk my head off. <laughs> no, no, that was terrific. You know, it's funny because before you started the presentation, Rebecca typed in the chat, well, what's wrong with oil? And you pretty much told us. Would you like to take yourself off screen share so that we oh, can- Oh, sure. Yeah, thank you. Well, you know, it's interesting, Sid, because all the foods I tell people not to eat for reasons of weight loss or just optimal health were all the ones that you covered today. Yeah. Funny how that works, isn't it? It's funny, all the things that people yeah. want to eat, you know, a cheese and sugar and alcohol, these are all the things that are inflammatory. Mm -hmm. They really are. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, it's funny because before I became a chef, before I went to culinary school, my job was as an activity director at a retirement home. And you could really see how people aged. I mean, of course, part of it is genetic. I, I understand that with wrinkles and things like that. But the people that ate the most inflammatory diets, or the ones that didn't look as well as the ones that ate mostly whole plants. Mm -hmm. It's true. And you can have your CRP level checked, but you know, you don't need to really go to a doctor to do that. You can order a blood test online. I like to use Alta blood tests. That's the one I, Alta lab test. So I just had my CRP checked because I hadn't ever done that before, but thankfully it was under one, you know, because we eat a whole food plant-based diet. Yep. Well, was, um, Sonia, who's watching live, says, what kind of test should we ask the cardiologist to perform? For inflammation or? Well, maybe sure. thing in general. Uh, there are no plant-based cardiologists in your region. Well, Sonia, you can certainly do an online uh, consult with all of the plant-based doctors. Now, I really would recommend you do that. Even Dr. Kim Williams, the past president of the American College of Cardiology, does, mm -hmm. does virtual medicine. Now, since the pandemic, it's never been easier to get a consult with any plant-based or lifestyle medicine professional, and it's very affordable. And often mm -hmm. insurance will cover it because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I, lo I love that you, you know. I know this, those ideas when you when you talked about fat being inflammatory. You know, we never want to shame people for being overweight. But there's such a, a movement of people, you know, health at every size. And from what I've learned from the doctors I've interviewed, like Dr. Furman, that that's not true because of the fact that fat, the fat that people have an excess on their body is inflammatory. It's almost like it's its own entity with these inflammatory cytokines. Mm -hmm. It's true. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, and, you know, it's funny when I went to the Optimum Health Institute, when I first changed my diet from uh, vegan junk to whole plants. That was July 6, 2003, when I went there with a Coke Slurpee in one hand and a Dr. Pepper in the other. I had <laughs> been eating animal products for 26 years. I wasn't having any dairy or meat, and yet I still was almost 200 pounds with the beginning of colon cancer. And they basically explained there that all diseases, whether it's a common cold or this COVID or 
stage four cancer, that's what, that's what disease is. It's inflammation somewhere. Mm -hmm. It really is very overlooked, I think, in a lot of areas. Yeah. Well, that's why in this book, Plan A Diet, all the recipes are yeah. anti-inflammatory. Yeah. And by the way, I'll just put a little shout out for that. This is only $10 on my website. So it's uh, the Plan A Diet, combining whole food, plant-based nutrition with the timeless wisdom of scripture. Free shipping too. Well, that's, so. <laughs> that's, that's such a deal. Who can, who can refuse? And, and I mean, it's one thing to be able to give a wonderful PowerPoint presentation, but to also do a recipe. Now that's- Yes. Not, uh, that's Should we a, get to it? I would love it. That's my kind All of right. It's like a twofer. I'm going to move the camera. So just bear with me very quickly here. How's this? Is my head chopped off? Really? No. <laughs> okay. How's, how's that? Can you see everything? The counter and everything? Yeah. Okay, good. This recipe is so good. It's called roasted balsamic mushroom quinoa salad. And it goes really quick. So I'm glad to show that today. We still have a few minutes left and I know I can get it in there. So the recipe is in Chef AJ's notes, I believe, right, Chef AJ? Yeah, it's in the show notes. And by show notes, we meet underneath the YouTube video. So if you're on Facebook, you're going to have to hop on over to YouTube to see it. Okay, so what we're going to do is first start with a dressing slash marinade. So here I have a quarter cup of balsamic vinegar. And two teaspoons of Dijon mustard. A half of a garlic clove. small pear, which has been cut up. Now I'm using a bosque pear today. I've never tried it with any other type of pear. So I'm using bosque, but you could experiment if you would like to try a different type of pear. A third cup of water and three deglet nor dates. Now these are optional. You don't need to put the dates in or you could use more dates if you want, you know, do a taste test after you blend this up. So that's all we need for the dressing. Now, I was thinking you could actually use a pear balsamic if you didn't want to use regular balsamic and pear. So I know that um, uh, I can't think of the fellow's name that sells the, the vinegars on your site, Chef AJ. Uh, Thomas. Tom. Thomas. We've been so, calling him Tommy Balsamic lately. Okay. Might have a pear. I'm not sure. I, I love his vinegars. I don't know if he has a pear one, though, but that might be a good alternative for this. Okay. I guess the Zoom is muting. Reminds me of okay. My reminds you of what? No, I, I, I was thinking this kind of reminds me of my barefoot dressing because it's uh, the pear and the balsamic and the mustard combination. Cool. Okay, so here I have 16 ounces of Baby Bellas, which I chopped up into bite size. And the size that you make these, it all depends on you. Just they're going into a salad. So if you want small chunks or bigger chunks, that is totally up to you. What I'm going to do is put a quarter cup of this dressing or marinade into the mushrooms. Oops. And toss that. And I'm going to roast these at 425 degrees on a still pat lined baking sheet. So I think 450 might even be a better temperature, but my still pats are only rated for 425. So I don't know if you're aware of that, that still pats do have a maximum temperature rating. And these are very old. I've had these still pads forever, but I know that they're rated for 425 degrees. So my oven's been acting weird lately, so I don't want to um, go over 450. So that's why I don't do this at 450. So let's spread those out and roast these for 20 to 30 minutes. Maybe stir them once or twice during the process. So, so there's a question from Stephanie. Do you saute your mushrooms uh, for this recipe? No, they're just raw. And here's the batch that I've already made. So you can see 
they didn't release a whole lot of liquid. You know, I've roasted mushrooms sometimes where they release a whole bunch of liquid. So these did not, which is great. So now we make the quinoa salad part, which is very easy. So the recipe calls for one cup of uncooked quinoa, which I cooked, I boiled with one and, a, one and three quarters cups of water. So that might differ a little bit from the uh, directions on a quinoa box. It's usually two cups of water to one cup quinoa, but this was one and three quarter cups of water to one cup of quinoa. And I've got that cooked and ready to go here. And then we've got our portobello mushrooms, which I'm going to slide right in there. You said your, your soap hats get all discolored too, right, Chef AJ? You've had yes, your soap they, do, they do, and, and I, mine was the original one from France, and I took pictures, and the company wouldn't really do anything about it, unfortunately. Oh. So... So I've stopped buying the expensive ones and get the Walmart <laughs> ones for five bucks. But yeah. All right. I've got four green onions chopped up. Three cups of chopped spinach. A half cup of slivered almonds, which are toasted. So I toasted these in a small skillet. And believe me, you have to keep an eye on, <laughs> when you do that, keep an eye on the uh, almonds because one little slight burning of them, it changes the whole flavor of the recipe, I know from experience. <laughs> so keep an eye on those almonds while they're toasting. And then one cup of chopped, um, or half rather, cherry tomatoes, however big you want to chop them. And... Geez, I should have done a test on this bowl to see that it was big enough, but <laughs> I think it's going to work. And then we pour in the rest of our dressing at this point. Um, uh, Jeanette said, no, it wasn't Jeanette. I'm sorry. Marina says, Are, and can you use another kind of mushroom if you don't have portobello? Sure. Yeah, why not? Can you use portobello? You could even use a different flavor of fruit. Like, you know, instead of a pear balsamic, maybe if you wanted to try something I don't know if like a strawberry would work or, you know, I don't know because you think how it would taste with the mushrooms, right? The mushrooms are kind of the big thing in here. Now this is it. I mean, this was really, really simple to throw together and you can serve it chilled or warm. Like if the quinoa was warm, you know, this would be a, a warm dish. I really prefer it chilled. That's it, except for the big mess I made here. So let me scoop up some in a dish. It looks pretty, it tastes really good. And this could be a side dish or even a main meal. It's got your greens in there, your quinoa. You, you remember, Sid, I learned this from Dr. Furman, but I don't remember the why. What mushrooms are one thing you have to cook. You don't want to eat them raw. I don't remember that, Chip AJ was... I know they have the polysaccharides, and but I don't know why that would be. I just to eat them I always remember that. Hmm. I'm not sure I've ever heard that. No, nope, it's true. Does anybody watching live remember the why? I love to put my mushrooms in the air fryer that's with pepperoni spice. That's my favorite way to do it. Okay. Yum. No, in fact, I can't think of one I would ever have eaten a mushroom raw. You know, it's, sometimes they're on pizza, which would be cooked or... We make roasted veggie pasta with mushrooms that are roasted. So I can't think of when I would ever eat a raw mushroom now that I think about it. Yeah, I mean, I guess sometimes at salad bars, you see them raw. That's but true. Anymore, since the pandemic, there's no such thing as a salad bar anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all, true. Yeah, and all closed down. <laughs> yeah. So that is basically it. This is like the simplest recipe to do today. And uh, again, be careful when you're toasting the almonds. I've got some notes here. And, and again, try a pear balsamic. But if you do, leave the other ingredients in, like the mustard and the garlic and the water and the dates. And you can always add more sweet or more dates to it if you so desire. Uh, but this okay. is... Oh, I'm sorry. As Sharon, a lot of people agree that they've heard the doctor say don't eat mushrooms raw. And Sharon says, 
that Dr. Furman says there are toxins in raw mushrooms that cooking removes. Thank you, Sharon. If we were awarding prizes, I'd give you one, but instead I'll just... <laughs> the belt. Thank you so much. So I didn't have to look that up. Oh, and Cheryl says the toxin hydrazine. Very nice. Wow. How did our ancestors know that, especially before fire? Wow. Hmm. I don't know. It's very interesting. I learned something every time I'm on your show. Whether and I learn like something it. every time too. It's like amazing. Like I should have written a book. Like all, it's been almost 500 episodes. I should write down the 500 things I learned from doing this show because it's true. <laughs> And in Bullion, I saw your question about green tea. We actually have a green tea expert coming on in May, somebody that actually makes it and produces it about whether or not you can put it in smoothies and things like that. Unless you happen to know mm. that, that question, Sid, about green tea. I got to see if I can find his question about that. But uh, yeah, um, I, I, I like it. Uh, they, they make one now without caffeine, without like any caffeine. It still has all those good qualities. Okay. <laughs> So we're going to have, right. have, well, this is, that salad looks scrumptious. Absolutely. Yes. Can you see this plate? Yeah. It's, it's pretty too. You know, it's good to eat and it's pretty, Absolutely. but I do like it chilled better. And if somebody wanted to maybe put a different grain, like, cause for me, I always think I always have leftover rice. They could probably put a different grain in, right? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, Alexi says, I think it's only the white button mushrooms that contain the toxins. I don't know. So uh, next you. time I have Dr. Furman on, I'll definitely ask him more about McGregor. So well, this is a wonderful presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. And I know you, you have a webinar. At, it's in the show notes. If people want to sign up, absolutely free. You have a wonderful webinar hey. you're offering people. Yes, it's fairly new too. I just created it. I spent a lot of time on it and released it maybe a month or, or so ago. It's called How to Get Off the Diet Roller Coaster and Improve Your Health Without Sacrificing the Foods You Love. And you can go to my website, sidnotter.com. It's on the homepage or sidnotter.com forward slash register if you want to take the, the uh, webinar. It's for free. It takes about 45 minutes. And you'll learn three really important tips there. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. <laughs> I can't wait. I think I'll register for it too. Awesome. Yep. Dina says she is lovely. Another website to add to my arsenal. Well, very Aww, good. Thank you. That's why we had her back, you know, and then, like you <laughs> said, said not her. You'll, you never forgot her. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for the wonderful work you do. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Chef AJ. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at the regular time, 11 a.m. Pacific time, when my guest is Dr. Richard Schwartz. He's going to be talking about his new book, the Veggie Revolution. Thanks again, Sid.